So today, I'm actually finally going to get into some of the nitty gritty of writing programs, which is like the whole reason that this thing exists. And that's what it's good for. <laughs> that's the thing that is fun to do with it. Um, programming it leads to unlimited possibilities, but today I'm just going to break down real simple stuff and we're just going to um, implement a loop and maybe potentially write to that register if I have time in my limited time. So um, there is, I'm, I'm going to start off with really just the, the most critical part and I'm not going to beat around the bush with it, which is that, uh, let me go to the desktop. For starters, let me pull up the data sheet because that is the most important thing about trying to do low-level programming for any CPU. Um, first, let me go to the GitHub project. And there are some helpful links at the bottom of the page. Um, for example, 6502 CPU datasheet. Um, a datasheet is basically just a document that comes with any kind of chip that you would buy. Anything that you would buy from an engineering standpoint has a data sheet. Uh, chemicals have data sheets, stuff like that, but I'm mostly familiar with the ones for electronics. So this is the 6502 data sheet, which describes all of the ins and outs of this chip, what it does, how you can make it do what you want it to do, some really technical stuff. Like, for instance, uh, my theme here is, you know, not letting the technical parts that you don't really need to know freak you out too bad. And for example, like at the end of all of these data sheets, they always have these, let's see, these really technical situ uh, sections like timing diagrams. You're never gonna need to use this. Uh, I kind of needed to reference it when designing the thing, but it's not necessary for programming it. Um, this is just instruction listings. Usually in here, the, the real scary one, which maybe they didn't include with uh, this data sheet, but there will often be like a AC and DC electrical characteristics section that looks real scary. I mean, like, for example, these charts. Uh, oh, yeah, these are these are some of them. So this is like really technical electrical characteristics. You'll never need to know that. Don't even look at them. The most important thing is, and the 6502 data sheet is really nice from this standpoint because it has it all at the beginning, but is the basic architecture of the thing and how it works. And for this one, to get things going, I'm going to gloss over it. But if you want to read through it, the first several pages here, I mean, the introduction, description of features, um, this section that describes all of the registers, I will get into that and describe what I need to and know more for this session because there's a fair amount you can get it into. But we're just going to do the, the necessary parts right now. Anyhow, it's all the beginning of this document. So you can kind of go from least complex to, to most complex. But one of the most important things in here that's kind of weirdly technical that I do need to show is that the CPU has to know when it starts up where to start up. And that's just kind of a standard. So it's different for almost every CPU. It's not like it just starts executing at address zero always. Every CPU has a slightly different standard on where it decides to start executing from, and you kind of have to design around that, which doesn't really matter to you as the user of this thing. Um, it affected me for figuring out where I needed to put uh, RAM and map other things in memory. But for you, all you need to know is that when the 6502 starts up, after it, uh, you hit the reset button and it resets itself and starts its initial execution, it has what's called a reset vector, which basically means what this is saying right here is that there are a few important locations in memory, which it's just memory. There's nothing like that the CPU is putting there. Just like in the, the first episode, um, we could write anything at those locations. Right now it's gonna be filled with garbage because I just turned the thing on. But we can use our switches to put stuff at these addresses. And these important addresses are our break and IRQ vector, our reset vector, and our non-maskable interrupt vector. I'm not gonna go over the non-maskable interrupt and the break IRQ, but I don't really need to because all you need to know for right now is that they're basically the same thing. Um, they just are for 
for other purposes, but we have one for reset. And what a vector is, is just an address. So what this is saying is that there are two bytes at FFFC and FFFD. Go back to the last episode if you uh, don't remember how addresses in hex work, but it's basically uh, right near the end of the RAM space. So the byte at FFFC and FFFD are where the reset vector is located. And the reset vector is literally just the address that the CPU should jump to at the beginning of execution. So when this thing starts up, when you press the reset button to reset it and it starts executing, the first thing it does is loads what's ever at FFFC and FFFD, puts it in what's called the program counter, which is the first register I'm going to talk about. And a register is just a location inside of the CPU. It's a little bit of memory, one byte. Each memory location is one byte. Actually, ironically, except for the PC, which is 16 bits, only because it holds an address. Um, and the address bus on here is 16 bits. So that one is actually double wide, which is also why these are two memory locations, because for a 16-bit number, you need two 8-bit bytes. Uh, that goes into the next interestingly technical thing about this, which is how addresses are stored on here. I think I went over that a little bit um, on one of the episodes with endianness. Maybe, maybe not. Either way, I'll go over it now. So how do we store an address in memory um, if we can only you know, put 8 bytes at any given location? You have to determine when you break up something that's bigger, like a 16-bit value or you know a 32-bit value, if you can only store 8-bit data, you have to figure out how to break that up, which is fairly obvious because they're all divisible by 8, so you just make it chunks of 8. But then what order do you put them in? Which also seems like it might be kind of obvious, but it's subtle and also arbitrary because you can do two things. You can do what's called little, no, big endian, sorry, getting them backwards, little endian, nope, I just said the exact same thing again, big endian, <laughs> don't worry, you, you'll just need to remember how it works for this thing. You've got what are two called two endiannesses, and what that is, is all it means is, in memory, do you store the bytes from zero to eight, or the bits from zero to eight at the first location? and then the next eight at the next location, the next eight at the next location, or do you do it the other way around? Do you store the last eight in the first location and then the next eight in the, in the next location? And so on the 6502, it uses what's called little endian. And it can be a little bit confusing at first because when you're looking at it like in a memory editor or even when you're putting the address in, it looks a little bit backwards. Because for example, if you were going to write an address here. Let's say, uh, picking an arbitrary, completely random thing, let's say um, you wanted to put address AABB. That's where the first instruction that you want the CPU to execute is, right? Um, on here, it would be obvious. It would show up as AABB on here, because obviously this is the 16th one, this is the 0th one. Um, I don't have my uh, secondary monitor set up, so I hope you can see my hands. <laughs> looking at yeah, yeah, yeah okay you can um anyhow but so which if whether this goes in the upper half or the lower half like i was saying with endian this for this it is that the small part so bits zero through eight the the smallest lowest uh order part of the number is the first location in memory. So that is going to be C in this case, because C comes before D. So if we were going to store the address AABB, it would be the value BB at the first address, and then the value AA at the second address, which sounds really backwards. There's reasons that it makes sense. Again, like I said, it's mostly arbitrary. Um, it's just whatever the builder of the thing decided. Um, there are reasons for choosing one over the other, but none that concern us. We just need to know that this is a little Indian machine. The first byte is the littlest part of the, of the value, and the next byte is the biggest part of the value. So there's your, there's your weirdness. To get this thing going, you first need to know that the reset vector is at this address, and that when you put the, the reset vector into that address, you need to put it as the small part first, then the big part. So, let's get started there, because we can actually, with the way this thing is built, we can start playing with that. 
and see kind of kind of what it does and see this in practice. So, how are we going to do that? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to address. So this is going to be remembering our numbers from last time. That's an F. All on. That's an F. All on. That's an F. All on. And C is if A is 11, B is 12, C is 13. How do we break that down? Um, did I do that right? No, A is 10. I'm going crazy. So A is 10, uh, B is 11, C is 12. So that is 8 plus 4 is 12. So F, 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 C is the address that we currently have in here. And what I'm going to write there, just for fun, let's actually do exactly what I just said. So let's put in, uh, let's put in B, B because we're going to put in the address AABB. Nothing special about AABB. I, would, I, I don't think that's even a valid memory location on this thing right now. But uh, anyway, so B, just to go over this again, this is 8, then 9A, because this is the 2's location, and B, because that's the 1's location. So that's a B. And I'll do the same thing. B... B. Nope, I did that wrong. B, B. There we go, because 8, 9, 10, 11. So that's B, B. So I'll use my deposit switch, put B, B at address F, 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 C. Now I'll increment to the next address, which just means adding one here, which just means flipping the one on, and now it is D, because it's 8, 9, A, B, C, nothing, nothing, D, because twos, fours, uh, sorry, actually, ones, twos, fours, eights. So that's F, 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 D. And we were going to put the A, A part there, so all I need to do is subtract one from each B. So now that's 8, 9, A, 8, 9, A, and we'll go ahead and deposit that there. So now again, we're viewing how we put memory, or put data in memory. That's at C we have BB, and at D we have AA. Okay, so we have those in memory. And now I'm gonna do nothing else. What I'm gonna do is, I don't even really need to change these, but I'm going to start executing stuff on the CPU for the first time in this whole demo. And I see we have 10 minutes left, so we're gonna, I, I think I can knock this out in the next 10 minutes. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to hold down the reset button on here. Uh, mine has uh, non-toggle buttons, like it's only on when you press it down and then it pops right back out. Everybody else's have uh, toggle switches, so when you click it once, it'll stay. When you click it again, it'll uh, un unstay. <laughs> it'll, you press it once it's on, you press it again, it's off. So just be careful about that. But you hold the reset button down, and then I'm going to make sure that I switch to manual mode here. It's the bottom most thing on the speed switch. And I'm doing this so that you can really see what it does when you first start it up. Now I'm going to switch it to run mode with our run or program switch. And now I'm going to step it a few times because the CPU needs a few cycles when you're resetting it to kind of go through its internal reset routine and make sure everything's in a good state. Uh, you can kind of see how flickery this is. My debounce on here is not very good, so I'll try and do the best I can, but it may uh, pop through two clock cycles instead of instead of one, but we should still be able to more or less see what's going on. So I've given that a bunch of resets, I, I, a bunch of cycles. I think it only takes three for a proper reset, but um, this only matters really when you're single stepping. Um, when you have this at slower full speed, you know, just tapping the reset button is enough because it'll go through a few cycles because it's running fast enough. So I'll let go of reset now. And now the CPU is in its reset state. It's ready to go. And as we give it clocks, it's going to start doing its kind of initialization and begin executing code. So let's step it. And you're, there's going to be a fair amount of garbage here. Like, this address doesn't mean anything to me. But if we keep watching, um, it's doing some stuff, but nothing that looks familiar yet until we get to this point. So uh, the reset procedure, once it starts running, um, does a few things that you can read in the data sheet what it's doing. They're not 
important to know. It's just a, all you need to know is that there are a few cycles after you release reset where it's doing kind of some more bookkeeping stuff. Uh, there are just several cycles that need to run before it starts doing what you kind of expect it to do. But if you look, this address is FFF. There's our there's our C on on off off. And there right now on our data bus is our B. And so what's happening right now is that the CPU is putting that address on the data bus. It's saying, uh, as you can see, this read-write LED, which we haven't talked about since the first episode, is on, which means it's reading. When it's off, it's writing. And so it is reading this value from RAM. So this is coming out of RAM right now, and this is reading it. So if we step, that just got ingested into the processor. It just grabbed that off the bus and put it into a spot internally. And now you can see our address incremented by one. And now we're at FFFFD. And now you can see our AA. Okay, so we'll step again. And as you can see, look at our address right now. It says A, let's, let's do this, A, A, B, B. So it grabbed those two values, put them into the program counter, which I kind of glossed over. I said 16-bit wides. It's a little memory location in here. And it's basically just a, a storage location that every time the processor executes an instruction, which again, I'd, I'd like to drive home, a clock cycle is not an instruction. An instruction can take several clock cycles to do what it needs to do. Um, on the 6502, it usually doesn't take many, but it usually takes at least two or three. Anyhow, now we're about to start executing this code because it grabbed those two values, put them in the PC, and then the PC increments every instruction, unless it's a jump or something. We'll get into those at a later time. Um, but read them into the PC, set the PC to that value, and it's going to start this cycle of reading or putting the PC on the address bus, reading what's in memory there, which we didn't... I, I could have written something in memory there to make this a little bit more uh, notable, um, but right now, this is just the garbage value that was in RAM there. It's not anything in particular. But the CPU is now going to grab whatever this is, interpret it as an instruction, and do that instruction. So I think maybe I will cut it off there. Let's see. It's 2.48, and this started at 2, so this is probably pretty much ending. Um, but next time, which I promise will actually be next weekend, if not even sooner... We will build on this to actually start executing instructions instead of just whatever this garbage is. It'll interpret this as an instruction, but uh, God knows what that instruction is. We'll have to look it up. And next time we'll look up instructions, which is actually going to be a little bit simpler than this kind of ham-fisted startup vector thing. But the startup vector is important to understand to get this thing going. And this is what you'll do every time you want to start your 6502 tutor from scratch and get it going.